Hello, my name is Lucas Hanna here at Historic Brattonsville. I'm the military interpreter here. Today we're going to be talking about clothing and equipment during the 1780s for the local militia. Now, if you're in the militia here in the 1780s and you're sleeping and it's a little bit chilly outside, you're probably going to wear your breeches and maybe even your stockings. Now, we're going to start with the bottom here and talking about that clothing. So, at the very bottom, I have white stockings on. They're usually made out of wool and most commonly wool. And then you have your breeches. Now, these breeches can be made out of a wide variety of fabric, whether it be wools and even up to buckskin itself, all except cotton. Because cotton's not going to be a really exciting fabric for the English here in the 1780s. Now, on top of that, we have our linen shirt, which is very long. It goes down to about my mid-thigh, because that's going to be your undergarments. That's all you're going to wear in the summertime underneath everything. It's basically your modern-day underwear, you could say. Now, after your shirt, you're going to have a variety of neck rollers. Now, what a neck roller is, all it is is just a big square fabric that can be rolled up and tied around your neck. Now, you've got prints such as this, which are going to be nice and polka dotty and fashionable, or you can have that floral pattern. So, now after that, you can wear a waistcoat. Now, a waistcoat is just basically a modern day vest, you would call it. Now, these vests come in a variety of fabrics wools, silks, velvets and linen here in the south as well, because it is quite hot. Now these waistcoats most commonly are going to be buttoned up all the way to about the third or fourth button from the top. This is sure that, so that men, men in the 18th century can show off those ruffles on their shirts and the nice little silver shirt buckles, which you might be able to see on mine. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You know, in the militia, there's a variety of clothing you can wear since, of course, you're not regular army. You can wear a variety of civilian coats. You can have longer coats or short coats themselves, but a lot of times you're gonna see what's called a hunting shirt. Now all a hunting shirt is, is a shirt that's been split down the middle with the bottom cut shorter, fringe added all the way on every single raw edge, pleats put on the sleeves and a cape put on your collar. And what I have on now is a thin wool flannel with a linen lining or muslin lining sleeve waistcoat. Now what a sleeve waistcoat, the name applies, it's a waistcoat with sleeves added and then they can alter it to add more or less buttons. Now this cut is sort of more of a mariner style cut with the cuffs that can be flipped up here as you see on my, both my left and right arm and it's a nice really workman's jacket. You can do a lot of stuff and you have a long range of motion in this thing compared to a lot of the other coats that you'll see. Now the, the coat I have on now, this green sort of cut back up. It's going very fashionable in the 1770s and going to the early 1780s. Now, of course, you see a little tiny epaulet on there. That's just to notify the rank. It's going to be this thing right here, that gold. Now that we've talked about sort of our coats, waistcoats, neck rollers, breeches, stockings, and shirts, we are got to have one sort of final piece of item to put on. That's going to be your headgear. Because the 18th century, if you're walking around without a hat, it's a little bit improper and it's unpractical because you're not going to have any shade around your head. Now these hats, most commonly you're going to see what's called a round hat, a simple round felt hat that goes all the way around your head, provides you a little bit of shade. Occasionally you will see a sort of a bucktail, depending on your region. You see a lot of that in Pennsylvania with the Philadelphia Associators, as well as some guys out of Vermont, and occasionally the backwoods of North and South Carolina. Now another type of hat that is very common, both in civilian and military aspects, is going to be a cocked hat. Now what a cocked hat is, it's going to be cocked, pinned off three sides. Some people call it a tricorn, but a tricorn is where it's evenly pinned. This one has one big flat in the back and the two more narrow pinches in the front. Now how they wear it, where the name cocked hat comes into play, you wear it cocked off your left going to your right eye. So the point is going to be right over your left eye. And when you're standing in formation in the proper military procedure, that's going to line up with your buttons with your eye as well. Now in the winter time, depending on the weather here in the south, but all over America in this sort of little ice age of the 18th century, you're going to see overcoats. And these overcoats come in a variety of styles, again, like normal coats, but there's a few consistent things. One of the most consistent things about these overcoats is going to be their design. This design doesn't really change much throughout the 18th century. In the 1750s, you're going to see overcoats that look pretty much exactly like this one with that short cape going to right about your shoulder and these big slash cuffs on, or box cuffs on your sleeves. Now they're going to be very large enough to fit another coat underneath it because it's an overcoat wearing it over something else. 
that's one style, but there's another style which has a interesting design that comes from the 1760s that you see here in America as well. But this other style of overcoat, like I said, comes back around the late 1760s, is going to be called a surco or surto. And it has a very similar to your normal jackets, which have that nice slash down the front. Although this one has a much larger collar than the other one that can actually be flipped up and then buttoned along here so that your entire head is covered inside of wool I mean, or velvet. It's very warm. It's not comfortable in those warmer months. Today we're going to be talking about loyalists and on being on campaign. So on campaign, both here in the south as well as up in the north and mid-Atlantic regions, you're going to see a lot of brush harbors being built when on campaign. Now while tents are used when you have a baggage train, we don't have a baggage train as something to carry your tents and supplies in, you have to carry it yourself. Now you're not going to want to be the guy carrying around a 20 pound piece of canvas, so you're going to substitute your shelter with brush that you find around the area. Now the summertime, you can be consisted of nice leafy trees, but in the winter you're gonna be using a lot of more evergreens and pines and cedars and stuff like that. Now it's a really basic construction, so you're mainly gonna have three main parts. You're gonna have your crossbar up that's holding the top, gonna to hold all the piece of the lumber or brush on the back here. You're gonna have another bar up here in the front, going off like sort of a T stance, going out to the left and to the right to hold it in place so you have a nice joint like a tripod you're going to have the exact same thing on the backhand side now ideally you can make this so it stands up together without any rope or string holding it together at all so it's just going to be held together by friction or you can also use string in itself now in huck's defeat or huck's little campaign itself he's going sort of on his own without a baggage train or anything behind him now he does have some horses but there's going to be some infantry there as well they're not going to have enough tents for everybody and it's going to be in the summer and they don't make it actually far enough to build any sort of brush harbors or tents themselves so with that not having many tents or supplies to build it they actually usually sleep on the ground in this campaign because they're moving so quickly they don't have time to build those brush harbors. but ideally you're gonna have time to rest these take about 30 minutes to an hour to build if you have enough about four guys you can build one in about 30 minutes one person you can build one in about an hour have it be nice and structurally sound and have a lot of nice covering on it now loyalists they're going to look very similar to patriots or rebels in the colonies themselves so they've all got the same sort of civilian clothing if they're in the militia they can have hunting shirts waistcoats a lot of the equipment they're going to be carrying is going to be pretty much exactly the same minus if you're in the regular army where you have a standardized military musket in the militia you're not going to have that now these lawyers are going to have a variety of weaponry with them from small swords on their waist, little sheath knives, and of course sheaths being nice and small. They're also going to have long arms like muskets and rifles. Now a musket or a fowler in the civilian context is going to be a nice, long, smooth bore weapon. That's not going to be very accurate, it's designed to hunt fowl, but you can be pressed into the military service and the militia. Now whether it be a rifle or a fowler, they're going to operate the same way. Of course you have your lock mechanism back here. With all the components that when it's fully cocked and pull the trigger, it's going to ignite the powder in a tiny little pan, sending the flame downrange. Actually sending the ball and powder downrange with that nice flame coming out of the barrel. Now the main difference between a Fowler like the one I just showed you and a rifle, is a rifle is a heck of a lot heavier. That nice octagonal barrel, it's going to be a lot heavier as I just stated, because it's going to operate the exact same way. This has a much greater accuracy, although it takes a lot longer to reload because there's rifling grooves in that barrel. So most often times that's also expensive. You're going to see a Fowler being used because it's going to be more of a commonly owned weapon. Although today they cost a large amount of money as they both do. And historically the price ranges are a Fowler is less expensive than a rifle. And today it's the exact same thing for a reproduction firearm. Now the clothing they're going to be wearing, it can be, a green coat, it can be a red coat, it can be a hunting shirt, you can have a brown waistcoat. It can really be anything that you want to wear because you're in the militia, there's no regulation. The most commonly thing that you will see being issued 
are going to be those hunting shirts. Those accounts of militia from Camden being issued gator trousers, which are basically just pants with buttons on the, at the ankles that are fitted to the leg, and they're also being issued hunting shirts. That's one of the interesting things you see here in the Southern Campaign is it's not just a bunch of ragtag guys, they still are, but occasionally you do see units being issued hunting shirts or gator trousers. Now, if you're in the Loyalist regular, regulars as in New York Volunteers, a regiment that's here at Huck's Defeat, which is just down the road to my right, about half a mile, they're going to be wearing red coats faced in blue with no, no lace on them and just functioning lapels nice and short cut and gator trousers. You're going to see those on those regulars, but if you the rest of the militia who's there, they're going to be wearing clothing very similar to what I'm wearing. You could have a silk vest, like we said earlier, and just, it's hard to tell. One way you can tell the difference between the Loyalists and Patriots, or the Loyalists and Rebels, is you don't see it often, but it is going to be a little teeny piece of paper if you're a Rebel, or if you're a Loyalist, you could have a little pine spring, but a lot of times that's not even used. So you, there's a lot of confusion on the battlefield between what side is on what. Now, of course, you're going to be on campaign. You're going to need to be able to carry all your stuff. And one of the most efficient ways to carry things in the 18th century is going to be a nice market wall or basically a big sack with a slit in the middle. You can put foodstuffs in one side, cups and plates or tins in the other side. Just sling that over your shoulder. And it's nice and easy to carry along with your fowl or your weapon. It's not going to be cumbersome. Now, while these Loyalists and Rebels look very similar, there's one minute way to tell the difference. You can either have a piece of paper put in your hat or a pine sprig just shoved in your hat band, although that doesn't really, it's not a very easy visual cue. You can't really see that well, and oftentimes it's not even used. There's, there's a lot of confusion on the battlefield, but regardless, the, the, basically the equipment and things you're using are going to be very similar. Now, on campaign, you're going to have to carry, of course, a variety of things, a variety of ways to carry it. Of course, have your blanket roll, which is going to be a blanket simply rolled up, carrying your blanket itself on a nice little hemp line tossed over your shoulder, basically hanging on your back. But you're not going to have room to carry all your personal items, your food inside that roll. If you're in the militia, you're going to want to carry your market wallet like we discussed earlier. Now, in that market wallet, you can have a case to have your journal in to write down anything. So just put Joseph Plum Martin does in the rebel cause, not the loyalist, but there are loyalist diaries themselves. And then you have to think about how you're going to actually load and fire your fire lock or your weapon. Now, one of the most common ways is going to be a nice a powder horn. And when this bullock's horn is going to be fine grain powder that you can use to prime and actually load the fire lock itself. And hanging off the end, this is going to be a little a powder measure. So you're going to pour a little bit of powder in there, pour it in your pan, measure it again, and pour it down the barrel. Now, with your firearm primed and loaded of course powder wise you need a way to get the ball in and you have to get your ball itself so for that you're going to have a shot pouch you made of bovine calf skin anything really it can be made out, out of linen itself now inside of here of course you're going to have your ball itself but you can also have wadding because you need wadding to basically seal the powder from the ball that can be anything from felt from an old hat to paper from an old cartridge itself basically just take a bit of piece of paper put it in put your ball on top, put more paper, and then ram that all down your barrel. But of course, you can't march a long distance without water itself. So for that, you're gonna see mainly a lot of wooden canteens. Now it's called a cheese box canteen because when you lay it on its side, it looks very similar to a cheese box. That's gonna be one of the most common things issued. It's not only the New York volunteers, but even American units, as well as loyalists all over the country and the colony itself. Now you can have all the water and journals you need, but if you don't have anything to eat with, you kind of just have to use your hands. But by this time of the 18th century, spoons and knives are extremely common. It's in the form of large, flat, what we consider today a butter knife, as well as sheath knives, which I have in my back pocket, and a nice pewter spoon. Now, in order to actually eat, of course, you're going to need something to put it in like a tin cup, which is going to be also issued. And with that, you can actually eat. Now, of course, you have you can on campaign if it's in a nice warmer month and there's some different varieties of food available, you can forage and get such as an ear of corn, have that available. Or here at the Williamson Plantation, they had a peach orchard. And around this time, the peaches are going to start coming out, so you could also forage peaches themselves. That's a good way to substitute your diet of salt, salt pork, beef, half pound of flour, or cornmeal 
that's going to get a lot more of a sweeter flavor in there besides eating salt all day long. Now, just as it is with any conflict, there's going to be two sides and two opposing views. Now, the Loyalists and the Patriots have a very similar view, although there's some fundamental differences. Loyalists, just like the rebels themselves, believe in the cause they're fighting for so much that they're willing to actually go through privations, starve a little bit, and actually be injured in the line of duty for that cause. Now, here in the South, Loyalists and Patriots alike, they're fighting neighbor versus neighbor. You have your friend down the road who's a Loyalist, and you yourself could be a rebel fighting for George Washington, although your neighbor has a very justified reason. He's seeing law and order being disrupted by rebels around him. He wants to preserve that. And one of the best ways to preserve that is to join the local militia. Now, he's going to join that militia, march off to maybe Camden, Definitely not Charlotte, because that's a hotbed of rebel activity. He's going to hope that Cornwallis comes, and he does come in 1780, 1781. You can see a lot of Loyalist activity at 96 itself. They're going to get all their gear together, march out to 96, and from there, you're going to see men such as Hux and his crew getting all their equipment, dragoons, Loyalist infantry, militia, and all of that, getting their stuff and actually marching to this very spot, probably going... There's a road in circuit that went just right past us, going down that road to the Williamson Plantation. This was, was marched off to engage at the Battle of Puxafee, or Williamson Plantation in 1780, becoming a minor footnote in the British history of the war, but being a large arouser for local militia of the rebel cause. talking about the food ways of the loyalists and patriot and pretty much anyone here in the southern colonies if you're in the military or the militia now of course you have different diets depending on what force you're with but it's going to rudimentarily be the same you're going to be about a half pound of flour and a pound of beef or salt pork per day you're going to be usually issued a mess tin or a nice tin kettle it's going to be one of those for about every four or five guys i think i was going to fill mainly with water in order to boil your meat or of course you can Fry it in a small pan or even a shovel with the end bent up around the edges. That's another method you see historically being used. We find at archaeological now, sites. You can cook a variety of your salt pork, which is going to be a pound or a pound of beef. That's per person. Now, a mess is going to be every four, four or five guys. Now, you can't have every single person in that mess cooking their own food throughout the day because that just wastes time in the army. You want to make sure you're efficient. So, you're going to have one mess cook. Now, he's going to take all those ingredients together. You're going to cut your beef into little chunks for each person. Cut your salt pork into each, each little piece itself. And you're going to have your flour. That's going to be saved for the end. Now, what you're going to want to do is you're basically going to want to cut your beef or pork into nice little cubes. You want to get your flour or your dumpling mix here, which is just right now just dry flour. So you're going to want to basically measure it by eyeballing it with yourself. Sort of mixing that together so you get a nice doughy consistency. It might take a few tries because, of course, flour is going to... It's nice, but there's a lot of excess flour that's not going to be able to cook. Just pour a little bit more water. Not too much because it's going to be very mushy. You don't want mushiness. You want that, again, that nice doughy consistency. It doesn't take long. Once you get the right consistency going, you just knead that around. Get it all over your hands and stuff. And just like historically would be done. And once you get these nice doughy little lump there, you can take it apart with your hands all sticky like. Sort of try and roll it into a nice little ball. And you've got one dumpling. We've got a second dumpling in there, a little bit larger. It doesn't really matter what the size is, just make sure you use all your flour because you don't want to waste anything that the army's given to you, because once you waste it, you've got to purchase your more yourself or bargain with somebody else, which involves you losing something. So like for this batch, we're only going to get about three medium-ish dumplings out, which are going to get all sticky as they continue. I'm throwing that on there. Now, once your pot gets to a rolling boil, you go ahead and throw those in, let that boil over for a little bit. Now that our pot's actually at a rolling boil, we've been doing that for about 15, 20 minutes now. We're going to go ahead and throw in our dumplings and just let them roll around at that boil and get nice and cooked. It's going to take probably around 
10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on the heat of the fire and how much it's boiling. And then we'll get back to you then. Now that the stew is finished, we can go ahead and take it off that fire. It's gonna be nice and hot. Don't wanna let it cool because you wanna get it when it's nice and warm. Now you can go ahead and fish out your dumplings, which are quite finished now. And didn't have the best choice of meat today, so we had some ribs from the local farm. So it's hard to find a nice piece of meat to get out of there. That's a piece of pork belly there. And sometimes on campaign, you gotta deal with what you get. And it's not always the best. It's not always the best. You might get some sort of trash meat with the officer sort of scramping around, just trying to do the bare minimum of work. But the one thing you usually can rely on is your dumplings actually being quite good and probably the best thing you're gonna eat in the day. Of course, you can always substitute your meal with onions or peaches or corn if you have those available, but you're gonna to wanna to try and make sure your dumplings aren't gonna become a wash of flour in your pot. While these hardships may seem pretty rough at certain times, those are just what the men on both sides are going through to preserve the cause they believe in. In the loyalist instance, trying to maintain law and order of the king, who's about a few thousand miles away, and the rebel instance, institute their new government with that new Declaration of Independence, signed a few years ago in 1776. Now with that, you can go ahead and eat your meal, or you can just sort of pass and eat your dumplings and focus on eating that nice peach that you have.